Hey everyone, whoever is watching, I am bringing with uh, WVUA in Tuscaloosa. Hey Gary, how you doing? Hey man, is this 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 light okay behind me here? Or? Yeah, I think everything's good. I think everything's okay. good. I'm going to record us on All right. YouTube as well. Give me just a second. How's everything going tonight? Oh man, this has uh, <laughs> been a week. I've got. Uh, I'm doing the um, Eastern Bama Bash five softball games Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And, you know, when you've got a full-time job and a radio show, trying to prep for that and get everything else done, it's, it's, I, it's a little more than I can – bite off a little more than I can chew, but I'll make well, it. Well, thanks for giving us five or ten minutes. I'll be, oh, yeah. I'll be ready in two seconds here as soon as I can get this thing to uh, turn over here. Come on, come on. There we go. Will this, will, will this work okay? Does it look okay? And Yeah. I think yeah. it looks much better I didn't than mine. Like Brandon was here, and I used his password or whatever we needed to do to get on the, the Google Live oh, that's or, fine. or whatever it was. But uh, I, don't think you're, uh, I don't think your set there is supposed to look better than the host. So you're, you're good to go. Yeah. Hey, I could go do it in the studio if you wanted me to. No, this is this is good right here. I won't be able to arrange this the way I want to on Facebook, but that's okay. That's fine. We'll go with it like that. All right, uh, we can start any time, so uh, I'll get us going here. Mark Rogers TV talking Alabama football. So I've got YouTube straight ahead of me. i got Facebook off to the side here, so uh, pick your poison, and I will be looking at either or. But uh, most importantly, we've got audio. And most importantly, we've got audio from Gary Harris from WVUA, covers the tide there in Tuscaloosa. Gary, how you doing tonight? Doing well, Mark. Uh, busy week, but good to be with you, man. I'm glad I could uh, get a few minutes to, to jump on here with you. I would have you run down your schedule, but it would probably uh, double our time on here together. So I'll let you just get back at it as soon as we talk a little football here. Alabama finishes with the sixth best recruiting class, according to 247 Sports, sixth or seventh in the nation. And I'm sure according to some of the people that you've talked to and hear from, the world is crashing down. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing, isn't it? Uh, when, when sixth or seventh in the country is considered bad. But, you know, when you're first or second for seven or eight straight years, uh, the expectation is so high. And uh, they didn't reach it this year. You know, Kirby Smart locked down the state of Georgia. What's interesting, Mark, is – uh, I thought they did really well in the December signing period. Signed 15 guys, including Jerez Parks, from you know last year, and he came on in and entered school. And I thought they were set up for that typical Alabama run in the late period. Uh, it didn't happen. I mean, they signed five guys uh, earlier this month. One of them was Michael Parker, tied in from Westminster Christian in Huntsville, who had originally agreed to be a blue shirt and defer his enrollment until next year. But when they didn't get some other guys, they had a scholarship available for him. It's a really good class. It, it's, a, it's a solid class. There'd be a lot of places around the country. They'd be celebrating the top ten class, as you know. But uh, the fact that Alabama finished out of the, the top three and really out of the top five, as you said, sixth or seventh, depending on which ranking service you, you subscribe to, and that Georgia was number one and, and Kirby Smart uh, has quickly – Establish that program, and that's Alabama's, you know, rival. It looks like as far as the overall Southeastern Conference, uh, you know, having had having had to play them and beat them in the national championship game. Yeah, there's a little angst, there's a little concern, and I'll be honest with you, Mark. I, I think Nick Saban learned some things. I this being the first time to have the split signing period, he was not a big fan of it. A lot of other coaches really excited about it. He didn't like it from the get go, and Alabama has a tendency to wait on some guys or, or what you might call slow play some guys. You know, uh, you know, go ahead and take your visits. We, you've got an offer. We want to see how this thing plays out. And they did that, I think, with some really good players. The problem is with so many kids having signed in the early period that in February, once they missed on a few guys, that pool of players wasn't as large. You know, to go back in, you miss on, you know, you miss on Bobby Brown, the big defensive lineman from Arlington, Texas, who wound up signing with Texas A&M. And then um, – Malik Langham from, from Huntsville, uh, Lee High School signed with University of Florida and another defensive lineman they were looking at from down in Louisiana signed with A&M. And all of a sudden, there's no other defensive lineman to go sign. So you're like, wow. Normally, the pool of players, because there was one signing period, would have been a little bit larger and more guys would have been available. So I think they miscalculated some things. I think the staff turnover certainly 
uh, affected it a little bit. Jeremy Pruitt's a terrific uh, recruiter. He had a lot of relationships with players. Uh, J.J. Peterson, a linebacker from Georgia, wound up signing with Tennessee. There's no doubt in my mind he would have signed with Alabama had Pruitt been here. Probably Quay Walker, another linebacker as well, who had a great relationship with Derek Angeli, the secondary coach. He's now with the Raiders. So I think it was a number of different factors that played into it, uh, and we saw Alabama slip just a little bit. The problem for everybody else is they're already so loaded that, um, you know, they can afford to miss on a couple of, of, of guys and be okay. But I think next year – Saban's putting this staff together. Uh, he's rejuvenating himself a little bit, I think, winning that national championship. The staff's going to be younger. I think there's going to be a new emphasis placed on recruiting, and I think they'll come back with a vengeance next recruiting cycle. I really do. But, uh, yeah, this one, based on Alabama standards, probably a little bit disappointing. But it's still a good class. Talking tied with Gary Harris from uh, WVUA, sports director there at, uh, in Tuscaloosa. And uh, yes, we're live on YouTube. We're live on Facebook as well. And you bring up so many good points. I don't know which direction to go. But uh, yes, if you're trying to build a program like Texas is right now with Tom Herman, and you've got national championship aspirations and you sign the number three class, that's great. But what you just mentioned is Alabama's calling card is they've stacked so many classes, a number six ranking, even if it is legitimately the sixth best class, doesn't hurt this group because they've got so much talent on the roster already and have things rolling. I just think it's the perfect storm also for the fans to point to, as you mentioned, Kirby Smart. Wow, didn't we just face them in a national championship game? They probably should have won that game in Mount. They're actually getting even better at Georgia, plus – uh, just just missing out on what was expected to be a late rush, a closing run by Nick Saban to grab some of those great players the final day. And besides getting so tame, they weren't able to do that to, to grasp a number three or better class. So what are your thoughts about Kirby Smart? This looks to be an interesting little rivalry cross division uh, that could be uh, meeting in Atlanta a number of times here in the next few years. I think it is, Mark, and I think that there was a great relationship between Kirby Smart and Nick Saban. They worked so well together. I still think there's a lot of respect. I think in Nick Saban's case, he says it's not personal, and it never is. I think, I think football for him is a game and a business, but I don't think he, he has any personal uh, bitterness toward anybody. I do think this, uh, like you said, it's a rivalry. It's competitive. I think Kirby Smart has taken a lot of the things that he learned from Nick Saban, and he has uh, you know, employed them there at the University of Georgia. And uh, I think he is on a mission to win a national championship and feels like he's got to go through Alabama to do it. And almost, as you said, did it this past season in just his second year. So, yeah, I think there's a, a lot of um, competitive intensity right now between these two head coaches, Kirby Smart and Nick Saban. I think there was some um, not ill feelings, but some – competitive juices that got flowing over the Marie Smith incident in Kirby's first year, the Alabama defensive back who, who transferred away as a graduate transfer to Georgia and was uh, allowed to play there. And I think on the recruiting trail, it's certainly been revved up a little bit. And, uh, you know, when you work for somebody like Kirby Smart, work for Nick Saban, you know all the, like I said, you know all the tricks of the trade that Nick Saban uses. And I think Kirby Smart has used some of those against Alabama. And Alabama did not sign a single player from the state of Georgia, Mark, this past recruiting cycle. And that is very unusual. In recent years, Alabama's done very well in the state of Georgia. So, um, yeah, it's, it's brewing. I think uh, when I said that um, Nick Saban had been invigorated earlier, I think that has something to do with it. I think the fact that they lost to Auburn, wasn't even sure that they would get into the playoff, did, and then beat Clemson, kind of getting a little payback from last season, and then was able to hold off Georgia and win that game. But knowing that Georgia – is is right there and Clemson's right there and Nick Saban I think feels like you know I've got to take it up a notch to keep um, Alabama where it's been the past few years and anybody that's covered him knows how competitive he is and I don't think the status quo is what Nick Saban's about I think he's always looking to improve always looking to get better understands that Jimbo Fisher's in College Station and Will Muschamp's in Columbia and Jeremy Pruitt's in Knoxville and Kirby Smart is in uh, Athens and Kevin Still, former Alabama defensive coordinator, is down at Auburn. All of these guys know the Alabama formula. They know the, about the process, and they're going to try to use it to their advantage. And Alabama is the team that everybody's shooting for. So I think Nick Saban realizes that. Uh, the little bit of a drop-off in recruiting is uh, an example, I think, of what this conference has become 
and where it's going. And I think it's going to be harder for Alabama to get number one rated recruiting classes going forward. I certainly wouldn't say that they won't, but I think stringing them together the way they have in the past is going to come to an end. And that rivalry between Alabama and Georgia, yeah, it's real. And uh, they're not in the same division, but at the same time, um, most years, if you, you know, play in the SEC championship game, you're going to the college football playoff if you win it. Alabama was able to bypass that this year, but I think those two teams can meet up again in Atlanta next year in the, in the SEC championship game. So that's what we could be seeing conference-wide within the division, of course. It's typically LSU and Auburn over the last uh, 10 years during Nick Saban's run that have taken their shots <laughs> at Alabama. But you mentioned the name Jimbo Fisher. So did that catch anybody's attention? Because there's only a handful of guys walking around with national championship rings, and he's, of course, one of them. Yeah, uh, what is it? Three, I guess. Uh, Nick Saban, Dabo Swinney, and, and Jimbo Fisher. That's it. Isn't Urban that Meyer. And Urban Meyer. So there's four, yeah. And three uh, three of them are uh, right here in the South, two of them in the SEC. Yeah, got to get Urban Meyer in there because he's got multiple ones. But I think Nick Saban's got, what, six, and the rest of them combined have five. Is that right, Mark? That would be right, three, yeah. one, and one. There you yeah. go. So, uh, Not bad. You can't, forget, can't forget about Urban Meyer. He is certainly a, a great football coach. But, yeah, I think Jimbo Fisher at Texas A&M, is a threat. I mean, that's a program that has tons of resources, as we know. Uh, I think everybody's just continued to feel like, wow, why can't they get over the hump? Well, they're not paying that guy $75 million to not get over the hump. He's serious about taking Texas A&M to the next level. Texas A&M is serious about him being their guy to do it. And uh, I do think you're going to see an uptick. They came in here in a short uh, span of time and um, finished strong on the recruiting cycle, beat Alabama for Bobby Brown, as we mentioned, beat him for Glenn Bill, the defensive ta- alignment out of John Curtis High School there in uh, River Ridge, Louisiana, in the New Orleans area. And um, Jimbo Fisher knows what it takes. And, uh, man, it's going to be it's going to be interested in the SEC going forward, no doubt about it. Do you think, uh, Gary, that Najee Harris is going to be that next guy to be a national star? I do. I do. I think he's a total package. Now, I think this year, uh, Damian Harris is a quality back. I, I I wasn't for sure that he would come back for a senior season, but I think he's one of those young men that really likes going to college. He really likes everything about it, not just football. And he'll be the starter. Uh, Najee will be the be the number two guy. But my gosh, you saw the the second half of the the national championship game. Obviously, it was two of Tonga Valoa's coming out party, but I thought it was for Najee Harris as well. Yeah, he's a special talent. I mean, you know, six three, two hundred twenty five pounds. You know, four five forty, strong, athletic, vision. Yeah, total package. He, he's he's going to be a superstar. Gary, you've got a ton going on. I'm going to hit you with one other question because obviously this is on the minds of everybody, not just that loves Alabama football, but follows college football. It's Tua, it's Jalen Hurts. You just alluded to it. So it seems to be a foregone conclusion when somebody steps on the national stage as Tua Tungabailoa did against Georgia, even though the sample size is small, to perform under that kind of pressure and pull out a game down by 13 points, he would have to be the starter, or is it not so cut and dry? It's not so cut and dry. I think that Nick Saban has a lot of respect for Jalen Hurts, has a very good relationship with him, and Jalen Hurts did win a lot of football games, did take Alabama to two national championship games, uh, is a guy that carried out the game plan that Nick Saban wanted carried out every week. I think what will happen, Mark, is that they will go into spring competing for the job. My experience covering Nick Saban is that no starter will be named coming out of spring. I think they'll go into fall practice, and the job will still be open. I My guess is, yeah, that Tua Tonga Valoa, uh, based on what we've, we've seen, will win the starting quarterback job, but I wouldn't bet my life on it. No way. Because I, I still think that um, Jalen Hurts is a good football player, depending on – what they want to do offensively. Maybe they'll play both guys. But I, it's, it's not just cut and dry, in my opinion, that Tua Tagovailoa is going to be the starter. But at the same time, I think they want to throw the football more. I think they want to throw it more effectively. And clearly, uh, he has special arm talent. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But Jalen Hurts has been a really good player here. And uh, I don't think Nick Saban is going to go up to him and say, you're not in the chase for the starting job. I just don't think he'll do that. I think the competition will be open, and it might be open all the way up until the season opener against Louisville down in Orlando. Because as you well know, Gary, when you get in that situation, as Tua did after the sack, 
that throws him back to like second and 18, of course, you're thinking, okay, we're down a field goal. The smart football fan, of course, we got to dink and dunk and just get our back self back in field goal range and try to get to another overtime. But man, that kid, <laughs> ice water in his veins, bam, yeah. touchdown. Crazy. Just an incredible play. And I think too, uh, you know, the fact that Papanastos had missed the short field goal from the middle of the field in regulation might have played into not only Tua's thinking, but maybe into Brian Dable's thinking. They might have said, hey, man, we can't nickel and dime because we don't want to try a field goal. We got to go for this thing. And, uh, you know, I still say in cover two, the safety, regardless of the job that Tua did looking off, he should have still got off the hash and got over there to the sideline. But he didn't. It was a pinpoint throw and one of the great player, plays in Alabama football history. And it's going to be fun watching both these guys. I just never want to sell Jalen Hurts short, Mark, because I've watched him for two years. I know what kind of competitor he is. I know what kind of football player he is. So while a lot of people try to make it, uh, you know, a negative to have, have Jalen having been a two-year starter and feeling like Tua is going to replace him, I don't see it that way. I think it's, it's Alabama's fortunate to have two great quarterbacks. And within the team – the dynamic between those two, there's no issue. You saw Tua support Jalen all year, and then Jalen, in the biggest game of his career, gets benched for the second half, and instead of sitting over there and sulking, he's the biggest cheerleader Tua had. That's the way they approach it, and I think that's the way they'll approach it throughout this competition. And I'll just uh, sit back and let it play out and see what happens. And unfortunately, we tie the wins and therefore the championships to the quarterback so much we forget Jalen Hurts walked off the field against Clemson the previous year with a lead. He couldn't do anything else. He led the, what could have been a game winning drive against Clemson mm -hmm. and didn't get back on the field. Yeah, he did everything he could. I mean, you know, two minutes to go, he takes some. Remember that, uh, I guess it was a third and our fourth and down play where he threw it back across the field to our Darius Stewart. I think it was third and 18, and they got 17, and then they converted the fourth down. And then, of course, he busted the run. You're right. He walks off the field. You think you got a very good chance to win the game and give Deshaun Watson and those guys credit. They made a lot of plays to get down there and, and win the football game. But Jalen Hurts is a winner. And uh, Tua Tagovailoa is a special talent. So I think Alabama's in a good situation at quarterback, Mark. All right. He is Gary Harris, WVUA sports director, longtime sports director, and much respected talking Alabama football. Gary, this helps us out tremendously. So thanks for taking the time. I know you've got a ton going on. Well, it's my pleasure, Mark. Good to visit with you. Take care. Okay.